Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, welcome to this presentation. Today I want to talk about data unit tests and what they are and why you need them. So actually this presentation should take around 20, 25 minutes. So what I'm really looking forward to actually is actually the Q&A afterwards. So um, yeah, with that, let's dive into the agenda. So I will begin with a short intro, then I will define what data unit tests are and explain their importance, uh, especially when building uh, data products. Then uh, I will present some framework you can use to perform data unit tests and also show some uh, live coding. And uh, after I will display a bit how we tackle it at my company, Get Your Guide. And yeah, conclude and open for questions, uh, discussion. Okay. So uh, my name is Theo. I'm a data science manager at Get Your Guide. And uh, Get Your Guide basically is a marketplace of travel experiences. Um, that means that basically uh, we, uh, in my team in particular, we are responsible of the uh, ranking of the experiences of the platform. And to do so, we rely heavily on data to achieve this or end goals of ranking. And basically, that means that what we call it is like we're building data products. And uh, it's the re big reason why I want to talk about data unit tests today. Uh, so basically, if you think about uh, data products, this is a combination of code with data. That's how you can uh, build this uh, data product. It's actually, if you think in classical um, software development, it's, it's common practice that to ensure the quality of your code, uh, you ought, do have some kind of automated test. Everyone is pretty aligned about that. Uh, but the focus here is on testing the code itself. To ensure the quality of your uh, data product, you will need to validate the code, of course, but also the data because it's part of what's end up being uh, used at the end. Um, and one way to validate the data is actually to have test, data unit tests, for example. And actually, if you think, uh, step back a bit. So if you work in an organization that already have uh, multiple engineering teams, um, Actually, the codes that you own and you are changing on the day-to-day -day is usually owned by the team, and they have, hopefully, full context of when they, when they change it. However, the data that you are using is very likely not produced by your team. It's produced by some other teams, and maybe you have yet another team that is transforming, uh, transforming it before you use it. And they very unlikely they have the full context on how you are using the data. So as an example for us, uh, basically we combined around 10, 10 different data sources for basic, to be able to rank, uh, to rank uh, all the activities. And same thing, we also have some recommendation system and we end up using the kind of the same numbers. So it's pretty lot, a lot of different sources of data that we end up using. So, what, in this, in a sense, basically, what are data unit tests? So they are here to verify some kind of expectation that you have on your uh, production data. I want to make it clear that uh, there is a distinction between testing your algorithm. For example, is your function logic able to handle null value? That will be a unit test. You want to make sure it will not break. But testing that your data set uh, that does not have null or does not have too many null in production is something that is a data unit test. And things that you might want to test as part of your data unit test is, for example, that your mean, max, average of a certain column is okay. Like, for example, if you are computing some kind of conversion rate or click-through rate, if it's higher than one, it's probably there is something wrong somewhere. Um, so you want to verify maybe probably that you have uh, no missing values or maybe uh, not too many missing values. Um, you might more verify that you not have duplicates in some columns. You might also verify that the number of samples that you have is reasonable. If you always get around 10,000 rows every day, 
random example, and suddenly you get one million, it's probably there is something really wrong happening. Okay. So I think now you have a kind of an idea of what data unit tests are. And uh, now I want to get a bit uh, overview of kind of the frameworks that I, I found uh, online. So the first one, great expectation. Um, it's uh, also put some, some st stats around. So uh, that's the most active project. Uh, it supports most of the formats. Uh, and also, really, I think it's uh, render some kind of data documentation. You can think of so like human readable documentation of your data. And so, yeah, that's the most feature complete. The other one that I find also pretty interesting is uh, Pandera, which is also pretty active. Um, and that was originally built, as you can guess from the name, built for pandas to do some validation. Uh, but uh, then last year they introduced this um, PySpark pandas uh, check, and very recently also uh, Spark SQL uh, check. So you can basically put your uh, Spark code, uh, your Spark data frame, and be checked by uh, this library. Uh, but it's more focusing on validating the schema, and there is no uh, data location or visualization like great expectation. Uh, then uh, also like uh, another one that's pretty uh, interesting, the uh, TensorFlow uh, data validation. So it's part of this whole uh, ecosystem of TensorFlow Extended. Uh, surprisingly, not very active, um, and actually pretty tightly integrated with the TF ecosystem. So if you are not Doing TensorFlow is probably pretty hard to integrate with your uh, framework. But they have some kind of data documentation, data visualization on top. And finally, also, so uh, Soda, um, I think that's uh, similar to Great Expectation, uh, but started more recently. Um, yeah, that's a kind of, uh, I think, uh, I would say, a, a contender. Um, but here, I think there is a pretty clear winner with the great expectation and as the most feature complete library. And so that's the one we'll dive in uh, now. So, great expectation. I will gi give you some kind of uh, key concepts. The first one is expectations, and which is basically an assertion about your data. So, basically, exactly your data unit test. Second, um, uh, the, what is pretty nice about this is that the most, co most common use case are already implemented. So if you want to make sure that a column have a set below a certain percentage of null or have no nulls or mean, max, etc., all these kind of common things are already implemented, so you don't have to do it yourself. But of course, if you have some kind of custom logic, you can also uh, use their, extend their, their object to, to do it. Um, the second one is this uh, data profiling. Uh, basically, what you can do is you have a data set. You know it's correct because you manually inspect it, and you can pass it through to, to build already some kind of draft expectations. Uh, they are not perfect. They sometimes not give the, the right expectations, but it already get, get you started with something, basically, instead of having to manually write everything of what you expect from all your data set. Uh, then they have this uh, data validation. So basically what you want to do is once you have all this uh, expectation on your data, when, when you have a new data, you, a new data set, well, you, you want to, uh, to validate it. And basically uh, you have some kind of collection of, all your, expect of your, all your expectations. And if some or at least one is not accepted correctly, then you want to be able to be alerted via email, Slack. And finally, this kind of uh, data documentation, which I think is pretty uh, really interesting. It's a kind of auto-rendered documentation of the, the data, what's your expectation you have on the data. And um, so what you can think of it is like some kind of constantly updated data quality reports of your data. Okay. So uh, with that, I think like code is probably better. You will get a better understanding. So uh, let's dive into some uh, code. So what I want to show you is um, how to we can create some data unit tests with great expectation. And you might have heard from our, my accent. So 
I'm French, so of course uh, I will use some kind of wine example. Um, so yeah, this uh, this uh, this one is uh, is it is it too small or can I should I increase the the size? Yes. Okay. So. never too big. <laughs> okay, so basically uh, what we'll do, we'll first uh, install great expectation, and then we have some imports. Basically what we will have is two, um, uh, we have two data sets, we have a, red, a white wine and a red wine, and uh, first we'll load the red wine, we'll do some, write some test about it, um, we're using this data set, and then we'll load this white one and validate uh, that the, the white data set is also correct, basically. So uh, we can import here. Um, so first we'll uh, set up some, uh, some great expectation on Databricks. I do not want to show all the things here. Um, for the sake of time, I think we'll want to focus more on this uh, part of creating the expectation and then validating them, uh, but feel free to dive in. Uh, there will be the link in the, in the presentation afterwards if you're interested. Okay, so what we want to do is, oh, sorry, where am I? So we want to load this data set. And it's reading a CSV, it should not be that long. Okay, great. And so here is the table, basically I do a display. So here you have different columns and uh, so the quality is the one that we'll look at. And um, basically what we want to do is setting up some uh, great expectation in Databricks. And then we can start building some unit tests. The first thing we want to do, uh, then the quality column that we had on top here, uh, basically uh, from the documentation, we know that it should be an integer in the range from zero to 10. So basically let's, Let's validate that. Let's put that as an expectation that you have on our data. And here, well, basically we have this validator from great expectation, and then we can expect, uh, then we set, can specify the set. Great, looking good. And then we'll look into the sulfats. Um, and here, what we want to do is uh, to perform some uh, callback lib uh, diversion test. In other words, what in practice, what we are looking at is the histogram of the values, and if the histogram of, we expect this histogram to be similar to the one that we will build now, and if it's different, then that means that the distribution is different. That's what we are trying to do. So here, same thing. So we'll build this. Great and it shows some something looking good. Then now what we can do is save our expectation. And now what I, what I talk about, and now you will get a better understanding, is how we can uh, generate and show some data documentation. So here we are going to show this uh, data, and basically you get some kind of uh, HTML, so easily to, that you can uh, then deploy here. I'm just displaying it inside the Databricks, but basically you have some HTML that you can then access uh, and so here is like the list of the expectation that we have. So we have two, and what we expect is the quality to be in this range and the sulfats to have this distribution. Now, okay, great, we have all here. Of course, you would like to have more than that, but here is for the sake of time. Uh, let's go with just these two. And now we load this uh, white wine data set. Uh, and we have some, if we have some wine, some people who can uh, guess, um, some wine lovers, uh, yeah, this kind of uh, property are maybe a bit different, and so let's check. So basically what we want to do now is to validate this data set to see if it's the same or have the same expect, or we want to validate the expectation. And 
what it's telling us. Okay, so let me close this thing. And they say, okay, it failed. Actually, we have one successful expectation, but one unsuccessful. Um, what happened is actually the quality is good. We indeed have the things in the values. However, the sulfats, uh, as you can see, is we expected this, uh, this uh, distribution. That was our expectation. However, our observation was different. We saw this. So it's too different given the, the constraint that we have. Um, so that's it. Uh, we, we have then basically you start your exploration by having some kind of example and you see directly what's, what's wrong with your data set and what, what could be uh, where you have some kind of head start when you debug. Okay. And yeah, with that, uh, I will go to the next part. Um, so I will explain how we are use, uh, using data unit tests uh, at Get Your Guide. But uh, first, let me share a bit some, some, kind of, some incident we, that we had in the past that kind of triggered these initiatives. So what happened uh, in the past is, for example, what, once we have some kind of a change in the data structure that led to have some uh, duplication in our recommender system. Um, then we also have a lot of, uh, we had some missing feature in our daily uh, prediction job. So basically the model was predicting out some empty, some, um, for some feature that it was trained on was not pre uh, present for the predictions. Um, and uh, also we had some, uh, one one where you use the wrong column uh, with some mistakes, so basically the scoring was more or less random. Uh, of course, as a following the good practice of incidents, though we took actions uh, to avoid reproducing them, and so for example, that's how we introduce this great expectation. Uh, we use it to validate our recommendations, and also we use it to validate our key event. Um, we also have introduced some health check as part of our continuous integration. So basically, we, as part of the data set, we verify that we have some properties that are verified this kind of data unit test. We want to make sure that we, are, we have bookings for every platform that we support and things like that in our data set before we send it to, our tra to train a new model with this. And also, uh, more recently, uh, we are starting to explore some SaaS solution uh, in the space. Uh, they are pretty active, uh, but still in the valuation phase, basically. Um, and yeah, so with that, uh, I would like to conclude. So basically, uh, what I hope to transmit during this talk is the that's the importance of the data uh, data test, uh, especially in data products. Um, I think it's pretty commonly accepted that you should test your data. Uh, sorry, you should test your code. Uh, not so much is discussed about testing the data, uh, but I think it's as important or even more important. Um, and yeah, so I think it's a new domain that needs awareness and yeah, as, as I uh, showed a bit in Get Your Guide, so there is no silver bullet. We just say, like, we'll roll out get your, uh, great expectation everywhere, and we're all done. No, it's a bit more complex. There are different use cases, and not everything is, uh, uh, yeah, we didn't find a silver bullet that can be rolled out everywhere uh, at this point. And, uh, yeah, so we tested multiple approach, and uh, we'll see what leads us, so pretty interesting to see. I will see in the, what's happening in the following year. And uh, with that, open for q and I don't know how much time we still have, but we shall have quite some time. If you have any questions, you can queue to these microphones, actually. Um, and I'm checking the Discord channel as well. If you're... Uh, watching the live stream, you can actually ask your questions from South Hall to the. Thank you. Okay, ladies first. Thank you for your talk, first of all. Uh, if I understand correctly, you can use great expectations to identify data drift in the incoming data, right? Do you use it to retrain your models for predictions or like whatever you're using, or in automatic manner, or do you still go, like your data scientists check out the data afterwards? So one of the SaaS solution uh, is actually looking into this data drift in particular. Um, but in practice, what we are doing and we have been doing for quite some time is uh, 
retrain regularly. So as part of a pipeline retrain, we have models that we retrain every day, we have models that we retrain every week, uh, a few that we retrain every month, but that's how we, we tackle this uh, data drift. What, what we are more concerned, I mean, it, on this uh, white, red wine, like, then it seems like that drastic difference, actually. What I'm more concerned is the data drift that actually is, like, big error, like, that go from things between in the range from 0 to 0 0.1 to suddenly the next day it's 0 0.9 to 1. That, that's the kind of thing that, that happened, and it's more than drift, basically, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. So my question is, like, can you talk more about the workflow that will happen? So as a data engineer, it's like the workflow for code tests is like a kind of like merge requests and then you do all your tests, right? But for data testing, is that supposed to be always on for a pipeline or is that like just the, the kind of workflow that like works best? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, do you have all these kind of CI things where you can test your, your, your code? That's kind of given. Uh, testing your uh, testing your data actually that's that, that's where it get tricky. You want to test your production data, and you don't have that in your CI. So uh, what what we did is actually we integrated the CI by sending jobs to. So as you can guess, we are using Databricks, and actually we send jobs to Databricks, and we ask them to validate these uh, these things there. Uh, and we also put that as part of our pipeline that run every day. As we say, like we run things every day or every week, so we also run them here. Um, actually, we avoid some kind of incident this way with this kind of health check. We looked at basically some really thing, simple things of around like net revenue and things like that. We, like I say, net revenue should be positive on average. Sounds pretty reasonable. Right. Act actually, we had an incident that failed, like we, we avoid an incident to our system mm -hmm. because there was something happening in the past with um, with conversion rate, and so we had negative NR on average in our data set, and the whole health check failed in production. I never thought that this one will fail, but it did fail because of the incidents, and we avoid to deploy a model that was trained on negative NR, basically. So, oh, I see. Gotcha. So, yeah, that will be my advice, is try to integrate in CI. If you if you can, there are def oh, sorry, there are definitely some possibilities, mm -hmm. and also put them in the production because if you have the code, why not running it twice? That's true. All right, thank you. Uh, I think you just answered my question. To be fair, but um, what I was what I wanted to ask is that when you when you test your code, you test it during development, and then the tests are kind of isolated from the production code. While uh, and also they assume that data, you know, they assume a state of data, and then they test you test your code while data changes by definition, so I was wondering exactly this, like do you, do, would you have these tests in your production code so that you hold what you're doing if, for example, if you have batch jobs, uh, is that the way you would uh, plan it? Yeah, so maybe uh, to rephrase, so yes, we want to test it in the development and also in production, uh, but then you have to rethink your, your way you are test. Like basically it's not like, okay, I will give this four lines and I expect having this exact sum of uh, booking or something at the end. Like you have to say, okay, I will have, then you take bigger example, like sample of 100 or even 1,000, and you expect this number to be in this kind of range basically. So you have to kind of shift and be more fuzzy in your, in your test or basically you do things like, Common, like common sense, like net revenue should be positive or conversion rate. I mean, we expect, what we do is basically we expect bookings for ranking to come from all different platforms. So we have desktop, we have MWeb, we have the apps, and we expect to have, if we take a reasonable sample, a sample, a sample server reasonable size, we expect to have at least some booking in every of those, basically. So that's how we change uh, the, the kind of, it's not really a unit test in the sense, but we call it like health check. And it was really useful. Did that answer your question? Yeah, uh, can I have a, a quick follow up? Mm -hmm. um, I assume that with this test, you're still testing your code. You're not testing that the data quality is high. Is that correct? Uh, so, are we also testing the code in addition of testing this, uh, this data? Yes, we also do that. Okay. Uh, but we actually saw, especially for this kind of data pipeline, that it was much more useful and easier for data scientists to to have this kind of end-to-end -end health check that we maintain than having unit tests where you have to put your inputs, outputs, things like that. So for some part, I think it makes sense. 
there are kind of we we, learn, we get much more in terms of investment in writing those and uh, uh, confidence in the the thing that we are putting to production is right uh, from this kind of uh, health check and to end test with the production data. Thank you. All right, so I think you just answered my question. I was more interested in uh, your health checks, like what do they actually check? Uh, so you run them against production database uh, on the users, thingies, and stuff like that? Yeah, so basically what we do with this health check is, uh, so in the CI, what we want to make sure is that uh, the code change will not lead to a fatal error or like we are forgetting something. So basically, as, we, as I say, like bookings per, per, uh, per different platforms. We also look at the type of page that we expect to have bookings from the different type of page that we have, all these kind of things that we are checking. Um, but for the sake of time, because if we do that on the full production, it will take hours. So what we do is we do a sampling in advance to still have a reasonable amount, uh, but not too much that it takes too long. <laughs> Okay, so we, at our company, we name things a bit differently, so we name it uh, Sanity Check, and yeah, run tests against a production database, so I don't know, if user cancels the plan, then some other table should also change, and we check uh, that kind of stuff. So what, what are you doing with this uh, sanity, uh, sanity check? You, you check a database? So like, uh, we run it every day, and we yeah. just uh, check if some you know, business logic wasn't broken. Yeah. So like, if you know that uh, if from the data, we know that user canceled the plan, then the user state in the table should be canceled. And you know, maybe some task in between was broken, because you know, maybe we, we are running the canceling task uh, just once per day, and if that task fails, maybe just for one particular user, we use this uh, sanity check to then get notified, I don't know, the next day that, okay, this user should actually be canceled, but it isn't. So uh, the health checks you use are probably something similar or not? Uh, yeah, I, 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 we are simpler, we don't want to put too much logic, and what we do is not, uh, basically we, we read the tables that we have, and we, we expect them to be correct, and what we care about is like we join different events together, basically, to have our data set, and then we validate this data set with this health check. So this is the kind of end table that we test. We don't test so much the, the, the production table, but I'm, I'm from a data science perspective, on my team where we are user of this kind of event table. Uh, but actually our core data platform is also being like, we are working with them to also check these tables to have some checks there. So yeah, pretty similar. All right, thanks for explaining. Um, I have a question about uh, time series data. Yeah. Do, you have, uh, do you have experience with uh, data validation of time series, especially uh, seasonal cycles or seasonal trends or outlier detections? Uh, good questions. Uh, so, yes, uh, we have some, I mean, working in tourism, I guess, like, can you imagine? Summer seasonal. is a uh, higher season. <laughs> um, so, we, we have some, uh, some problematic. For us, in my, like, we're, we're mainly working on RICO and uh, ranking. What we do is, of course, the number of bookings change a lot. But however, when we look at percentage, but we transform them into percentage, what we care is like revenue per visitor or conversion rates. And this kind of thing do not, I mean, change a bit, but not drastically to, to, to a point there where we have this kind of problem. Uh, so yeah, we, we don't really uh, test these things, but what we, we do is, uh, actually with the SaaS vendor is having some kind of threshold and automatic threshold if the values change too much drastically on using some time theory uh -huh. logic. So you're looking to suppress the seasonal trend and perform your regular tests instead of uh, making really seasonal checks? Yeah, no, we don't, we don't do any kind of check like uh, things like if winter expect this thing, if summer expect this thing, uh, because actually it will not make sense one, one year to the next. I mean, the, the, the business is growing pretty big, big and like from last summer to this summer, we had a plus one per X percent uh, overall booking, so I, it will be a struggle to, to get this right number. 
So we prefer to do it with this kind of performance based. Thank you. Hi. Um, my question is about, and I think you touched a bit upon it, that when you use, usually run unit tests on your code, you want them to be fast because you want to then to have this quick feedback loop. Uh, and when you're testing data, potentially your data can be very big and you don't want your unit test to take like hours because then it makes development really slow. You said that you, in your case, you would sort of take a subsample of the data to make it faster. Do you have any suggestions if you cannot do that? Like if your data has to be the whole thing, like I don't know if you're on a map or something like that. Um, do you just have a different scheduling? Is it something you would run every night or something instead? Or? Hmm, good question. Um, so luckily for us, we can always sample. Basically, we have some kind of, like some kind of core thing that we can sample on, like we can just sample on the sub subset of our users, basically, and we just do all this operation. We check that on this subset, everything looks fine. And if we randomly sample these users, it's, it's fine for us. If you have to do it on everything, um, first thing is, have you tried a bigger machine? Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, trust me, we, 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 you can get a lot and you have some pretty huge machine and if, it depends how long it takes uh, for you, but just doubling, tripling, and you can get some, some pretty huge machine. And when we do the cost, or cost calculation is like, is it worth to spend more on a bigger machine or is it better to let our developer wait more? I mean, it's always the machine that is cheaper. So we always go with as big machine as possible to speed things up. Uh, and for the second part, uh, I think it's great to have this kind of, we, we have this as part of our schedule, basically, to have it every day. Uh, so here you have it. The, the thing I, I will struggle with is basically when you develop, you want to check that your code that you change now is still working with your data set. And if you cannot break it, I'm not so sure. We don't, well, luckily, we don't have these problems uh, in, in my company. We can always sample by activities or customers. Uh, that makes sense for all, like some kind of location or country. So we didn't have that. I, I would challenge, I'm pretty sure most of the problem can be break down, uh, but uh, I'm, I don't know your use case, so happy to discuss afterwards. Uh. Okay, thank you. Any more questions or from the... Yeah, I um, enjoyed the talk a lot. Uh, I was wondering how you would do something like this if you have like way more data than you discussed in the examples. So I, I often work with like distributed systems on like exabytes of data in the cloud. But I would be really interested to maybe if you do like spot checks or sample checks or something like that. Uh. Yes, so we, we sample the data uh, when we want to have the quick things, but also, I mean, if you have exabyte of data, are you using everything? So then probably you want to check at some point, not, not part of our CI, but you want to check that on the whole thing, you might still have some expectation of precision or uh, some columns, uh, null values. So you should probably check on your whole data set as part of your big pipeline where you use your data. Uh, but yes, for quick feedback developments, then we also have this kind of subset that we just use. And to speed things up, uh, what we also sometimes do is basically compute once this subset by taking some random sample, and then every time to redo this subset, we can just use this, this part, this small subset that we can quickly iterate through. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah, maybe to give uh, another thing, so like we mainly use with Spark, and so the, we have terabytes of data, but no more than that, and with, with Spark, basically, we just get bigger and bigger cluster. That's a <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty easy answer. Thanks. Do you think this can also be useful for uh, non-data products? For example, we have unit tests, and these unit tests uh, use um, test data files to load and process to check that this is still working. And whenever we um, migrate code, we also want to make sure that the test data is updated and not that the developer forgets this. And also that the test data also in future contains all edge cases that we want to cover. 
Yeah, um, good point there. This kind of uh, test file, test data, test sample that you have in your code, like really a 510, then you want to use that like unit test. I actually don't, I mean, I, I, I do not like them because what you end up is uh, like, I mean, what I've seen in the past and it was really annoying is basically you, you have your test set, you make it work for your use case, uh, you think it's working because on this subset it's working, but actually when you go to production, it's like, oh, actually this colon, no, they changed. It's not an int, now it's a float. So everything failed now, and it was working on your machine, but actually you didn't test with your production data. So I think it's having this real, real time data makes more sense. And maybe the production system, when they go from int to float, but then it makes sense for us to then suddenly our tests fail because suddenly our system is not working and you need to fix it. So I think that, that doesn't make sense and I, that's what I don't like with this same thing. And what I also struggle uh, a lot with is like, how do you get it test file basically? And how do you make sure you have all your edge cases present in the, this kind of test file? So uh, we also have some, but I, I prefer this kind of automated approach to go with some production data. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. I, I have a question I'm happy to get, say, how are you doing it? I... <laughs> I mean, how? Are you doing the same thing? Like, that's a, that's a question, so... I... Okay, so someone else is doing the CIA. Thanks. We do not have any questions on Discord, and I would like to thank to the participants for queuing and asking the questions. Uh, you can still catch up uh, with this uh, speaker in the Discord channel, as I guess you're a Python Discord channel. You can ask your questions later on. And I would also like to thank to the speaker for this great informative talk. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.